Christ City Church, welcome to worship this morning. Our God is an awesome God, is he not? I want to point us this morning in the direction of Psalm 93, which says, The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. And church, his kingdom reigns forever. Let's give him praise this morning.
coming after me again. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. One more. There's no shadow.
Well, good morning, Bright City Church. We are so glad that you're here with us today and that you've chosen to watch our service. There are so many churches in the triangle and we just feel really honored that you guys are here with us. We have a couple of announcements for you, but first we want to continue our worship through our giving. We like to say this is the way that we demonstrate the priority of God in our lives. And so you can text the number on the screen to give today. You can also give online. And we are just so honored that you would choose to contribute to our church and what we're doing in the Triangle. Speaking of what we're doing here in the Triangle, we have a serve day coming up on October 3rd. This is a way that we're gonna be able to partner with the school in our area, which is Parkwood Elementary. So please sign up for serve day. We would love to have you guys out there. It's gonna be a great time and it's really gonna be a blessing to our community. We also have a outdoor service coming up. Our outdoor service is on September 27th. We want you to know that there's going to be food there. It's going to be a great time of fellowship and celebrating the second birthday of our church. But something to note if you're not able to come is that we're actually not going to stream a service that morning. So if you miss it, that's okay. We'll have it for you the next Sunday morning so you'll get to see what you missed. But if you are able to come, please RSVP so that we can have food for you. We're gonna provide that. There are animals and all kinds of other really fun things to do. And of course, we just miss seeing you face to face. So we would love to see you there. Lastly, if you are new here, we would love to know that you're here today. Please comment in the comment box, but also can you text this number so that we can send you a gift? We're just so honored that you're here with us today and we hope you enjoyed the rest of the service. Well, good morning. My name is Sharon Miller. I am one of the pastors here at Bright City Church. And this morning, I am closing out our series, Defiant Joy, which has been our study of the book of Philippians. And so I'm actually just going to dive right in. We're going to be in the very last couple paragraphs of chapter four of Philippians. So if you want to turn in your Bibles with me or just on your Bible app or just read the screen, Philippians 4, starting with verse 10. This is what Paul writes. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again, you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my need several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied having received from Epaphroditus what you provided a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as I just mentioned, we are finishing off our study of Philippians this morning. And if you are brand new to Bright City, or maybe you've just missed a lot of this series, I wanted to give you a brief overview of what we have seen in the book of Philippians. So he's Paul, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. This is a church that he helped to start. And so he's, he's very close to the Philippians, but he also has a really special relationship with the Philippians. He's closer to this church than any other church. And you can just sense that even in this passage, you can sense that affection that he has for the Philippians. Now, Paul is writing while he is in prison. His fate is uncertain. And so the Philippians are really scared. They're, they're really nervous about what's going to happen to their friend, Paul. And so Paul's writing to them to encourage them. And one of the really striking things about the letter, which this is what this is, is it's a letter, is this theme of joy. Joy is the most prominent theme of this letter. Paul again and again and again, he says, not only don't be concerned, but, but rejoice, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. We see this word over and over and over again. Now, in this passage, this 
closing passage, Paul shares the secret to his joy, the secret to his contentment. But to understand this secret, what I want to do first this morning is to look at the verse in this passage that is one of the most famous verses in the whole Bible, and that is Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13, it says, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, if you are a Christian in America, or if you're just a person in America, you have probably heard this verse before. It's very inspiring. And because of that, it's one of those verses that people put on t-shirts and they put on jewelry and they put on mugs and they put on license plate and they put it on framed wall art. However, even though this verse is extremely widely known, it's not widely understood. And to explain what I mean about this disconnect here, I decided to do a little bit of research into how people apply this verse. And to do that, I went on to Instagram and I looked up the hashtag Phil413. So Phil short for Philippians 413. And if you're not on Instagram and you don't know how hashtags work, when someone posts a photo, they'll have a caption and then they'll have hashtags next to it. And hashtags enable people to find your photo. It's kind of like categorizing it in a way that people can find it. And so if someone would, would post something and then put this fill 413 on it. And if you're you know having a hard day and you think I need some inspiration, you can click on this hashtag and find all these, these messages. And so when I searched this hashtag fill 413, first of all, there were over 120,000 uses of it. And that wasn't just there were other versions of it. Like you could search hashtag Philippians 413. You, you could search hashtag I can do all things. So, so this was just for this one version. And I wanted to share with you what I found. So first up, I found things that I think are in the spirit of the actual verse, like what Paul is writing about. So I found a number of uses of it in reference to parenting, specifically right now during COVID, virtual homeschooling, a lot of parents saying, I can do all things. I can do this right now through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, I saw it in reference to overcoming cancer. I saw it in reference to maintaining sobriety. I saw it in reference to people who were finally graduating but then beyond that, I saw it in reference to a lot of things that I would say are not so much in the spirit of what Paul meant here. And I've tried to categorize them. The, the main, the, the number one category that I found is sports. This is where this is used over and over and over again. So just to list the sports that I saw this in reference to was volleyball, soccer, marathons, triathlons, football, cheerleading, cycling, basketball, mixed martial arts, jujitsu, boxing. That one kind of got me a little bit like pictures of bloody noses with I can do all things through Christ. But far and away, the, the, the most number of posts under the sports category, but honestly, also just in general, of, of calling on Philippians 4.13 was in reference to weightlifting, bodybuilding, and weight loss. I saw one guy who was claiming this promise for arm day of his workout. So that was the first major category. Uh, two things that I guess kind of go under the sports category as well, which I saw multiple references for was bass fishing and then multiple references for bull riding. So that's also, I would say, under the sports category. Now, there was also people using it to kind of talk about achieving personal dreams, a number of people who were claiming it for their multi-level marketing achievements. Uh, one person using it about starting a YouTube channel. There was another category that I couldn't even figure out how to categorize this, and so I'm calling this the standing on category. And so there were people that, I don't know why this was the hashtag, but they were standing on a beach, or they were standing on a mountain, or they were standing in front of an expensive car, or they were standing in a gym. Again, multiple references, I do not understand, standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. I don't know why they weren't even climbing up on top of the Eiffel Tower. They certainly did not build the Eiffel Tower, but somehow standing in front of the Eiffel Tower, I can do all things. 
And then finally, my favorite reference out of all of the, the hundreds that I looked at is someone claimed the promise, I can do all things in reference to them smoking a rack of ribs. So some of you, maybe this is resonating right now. For me, not so much. But this verse is clearly popular, especially in the American context, because it coincides really well with the American dream of self-empowerment. You know, we've talked about this a lot, where we live in a culture where kind of the, the mantra is, you can do anything. You can do whatever you set your mind to, that if you work hard enough, you can achieve anything. And because this, this is really the culture that we're all soaking in, a lot of Christians have taken this verse, taken it, and kind of mixed it with this American dream mentality. And so as a result of the, that, this verse is used to pursue that, that vision, where whether it is I am you know, winning the championship or getting the promotion or buying the big house, that we can somehow bring Jesus along, that, that Jesus actually blesses our efforts towards pursuing this dream. And so this is how this verse is, is very often applied. And when it is plucked out of the context in which it was written, it almost would seem that, that what Paul was saying is that, that God is this life coach in the sky who has helped him to achieve his goals. And that what he's saying to the Philippians is, and now because of how he's helped me, he can be your life coach too. The trouble is, this interpretation obscures the actual meaning of that verse. In fact, it completely contradicts it. And so I want to look at the context here to understand what was Paul really saying here in Philippians 4.13. So let's go back to verse 10. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again, you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need. Now, I want to pause there. Paul is thanking the Philippians for supporting him financially. But the way that he's thanking them is kind of weird. Because he's saying, thank you so much. I didn't actually need it, though which is just the worst kind of thank you. As I was reading this, I was reminded of last Christmas when I was buying a Christmas gift for my dad. And I don't know if you have a person like this in your life who is impossible to buy for. My dad is, is really difficult to buy for because he, he just gets whatever he needs. Like if he wants something, he just buys it. And so it's, it's really difficult to think of, okay, what does he not already have that I could get him? But this past Christmas, I actually came up with something that I thought was inspired. My dad has trouble sleeping. He's never been a good sleeper. And I've heard about this natural sleep supplement. I've had a number of friends who had used it and it had really helped them. And so I thought, okay, this is the thing. Like I'm gonna get this for my dad and it's just gonna like change his life. It's gonna revolutionize his sleep. And so I get this for him and on Christmas morning, he opens it up and he very politely, very graciously, he smiles and he says, thank you. And I said, have you ever heard of this before? Like, have you used it? And he said, yes, like, actually, I have heard of it. In fact, I've actually gotten it and I've tried it and it didn't help me to sleep. And it actually gave me an upset stomach. <laughs> but then he said, but then, so my dad's so gracious. He said, you know, but th this is like a different kind. This is a different brand, a different form. And so, you know, maybe, maybe this will help me. But essentially what he's saying is thank you, but I didn't actually need this, <laughs> which is just feels so terrible when you're the gift giver. And that is kind of what it seems like Paul is saying here. He's saying thank you, even though I didn't need it, which, which feels almost like an ungracious thing to say. But that's not exactly what Paul is saying here. Instead, Paul, he's, he's simultaneously wanting to affirm their generosity because they gave to him out of their love for him. They, they were worried. They wanted to support him. And so he wants to affirm that and he wants to express his gratitude for it. But at the same time, what he wants to do is he wants them to think differently about money. He wants them to think differently about possessions, 
about achievements, about anything that they think is necessary for human flourishing. And that is why he follows up with that that weird thank you with this in verse 11. He says, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. So again, Paul is expressing his gratitude for their love and their support. But he also wants to make very clear that the, the joy that he has emphasized over and over and over again, it does not come from anything he possesses. And it does not come from his circumstances. What Paul has discovered that the source of his joy, the source of his con contentment, it doesn't depend on anything that can change. And that is what he really wants them to understand. It's just the fragility of a contentment that depends on our circumstances, that depends on what we have. Because if your contentment does come from your income, if your contentment does come from your marital status, from your house, your car, from having the right job, then your contentment can be snatched away in an instant. But Paul, he, he wants them to have a contentment that lasts. He wants them to have a contentment that stands on something firm. And so while he's affirming their generosity, he wants to make this clear that the secret of his joy does not come from what he has. The secret of his joy, the secret of his contentment comes from Christ. Now, this brings us back to Philippians 4.13 in the context of this verse. Very often, this verse is taken to be about having, about getting, about acquiring, about achieving. It's taken to, to mean that Jesus is kind of the secret to getting those things, to fulfilling your personal dream. But as you can see, that's not what Paul is saying at all. In fact, he is saying the opposite. What he's talking about is a contentment that persists no matter what. A contentment that persists no matter what you lose or how you fail, how you are humiliated, when you experience your weaknesses, when you run up against your limitations, when you lose the race, to call back to the Instagram, when you fall off the bull, when you burn the ribs, <laughs> that what Christ enables us to do is to be content no matter what hard thing comes, not to protect us from those hard things coming. That it enables us to have a peace when we fail, not to protect us from failing. Do you see how this is different? Can you hear how this is different from how this verse is typically applied? That that this is so different from that gospel of self-empowerment. The worldly use of Philippians 4.13 says Jesus will empower you to succeed. But what Paul is saying is that Jesus will empower you when you don't succeed. He will empower you even when you fail. And so he underscores this by what he then says after. And this is his closing words in Philippians 4. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my needs several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus, what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. I want you to remember that. 
And then he ends by saying, now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. In Christ Jesus, this is the secret. This is why he is content no matter what. This is why they can give out of their need is not simply because of their love for Paul, but because they already have all they need in Christ. This is the secret. Everything you have is already yours. Everything you need, he has already accomplished. It is available to you. This is what he means by talking about the riches of Christ. And this is something that that Ike and I realized that we want to do a better job of teaching you guys and discipling in, in you this understanding of what it means when you become a Christian, when you accept Christ as Lord and you commit your life to love him and to serve him, that because of the Holy Spirit, Christ now dwells in you. You have available to you everything that is available to him. And everything that he has now accomplished, it applies to you. And this is something that that is so easy to forget because as I said, this especially this gospel of self-empowerment, it tempts us to pant after other sources of empowerment. It tempts us to pant after other sources of joy. And because of that, we can actually forget that. We can forget what is available to us, that this joy is already available to us in Christ. And so that's why it's so important to live in the reality of what is already available to us, to to trust the reality of what has already been achieved in Christ. And I know that this is a very, this is actually like a very abstract concept. And so as I was thinking this week, like how do I make this applicable, this idea of being in Christ, that, that Paul's joy comes from being in Christ, that his confidence comes from being in Christ. And the best analogy that I could come up with, and I don't even know if this will be helpful to you. I hope that it is. But I was thinking about when my kids were learning to ride their bikes. I especially remember this with with Isaac. Cohen is our little daredevil. And so he just kind of like took off, you know, danger be darned. But Isaac is much more cautious. And so he reached this point where he was ready to ride his bike. He had all the skills that he needed, but he still wanted me to hold on to his seat. And so he would ride around and and he would try and pick up speed, but I could only run so fast. Like even Ike could only run so fast. And so we're trying to keep up with him, but we're actually holding him back. And on top of that, he's constantly turning behind him to see, are you still holding it? Like, do you still have me? Am I okay? And so I was, I was thinking a lot about that and To be in Christ with this, think of this metaphor, to be in Christ means that we already have everything we need to ride the bike because really it's not us who is doing the driving. It is Christ. We are simply participating with him in that. It is Christ who has the knowledge of how to ride the bike. It is Christ who has the experience of how to ride the bike. Christ also has the balance. He has the muscle memory. He has the confidence to ride the bike. And so we have all of that in Christ, you know, thinking of the bike as our lives. But not just that, we also have the the freedom of when we take off, you know, flying on that bike, that freedom that we feel is also ours because of Christ. But then on top of all that as well, and this, this is maybe where I'm like pushing this metaphor to its limits, but Christ isn't just the driver of the bike. He is also the destination. He knows where we are going. He's taking us to a place of joy, but, but we are also driving towards the destination of him. So now I'm kind of like stretching this metaphor to its limits. But the reason that, that I, I thought of this metaphor is that for many of us who've been Christians our whole lives and who are kind of soaked in this self-empowerment faith, is that we don't treat Jesus as if he is the, the driver of the bike. We treat Jesus as if he is the hand. We are the ones who are doing the work. It mostly depends on us. We are also the ones determining where we are going. 
And no wonder it is that, that we feel this, this pressure, even though we call ourselves a Christian, we, we feel this pressure because we are the ones doing it. We are the ones, you know, determining where we are going, but we're also riding around a lot like my son Isaac when he's turning around, are you still there? Are you still there? Checking to see if my hand is still there. We're doing that same thing with God. Where we're saying, are you still there? Do you still have your hand on the bike? And God is saying, let me take the bike. I know how to ride it better than you. I invented it. I created it. I know how it's meant to be run. I know where it is supposed to go. You can go faster. You can go sure if you would just surrender control. But do you trust me? And that is is why I I get so frustrated with this popular application of Philippians 4.13 of just tacking Jesus on. Because it's not, rather than giving it all over to Jesus, it's essentially saying whatever your dream is, just bring Jesus along. And that's actually an incredibly insecure place to live. And it, it also means that we will end up running after things for contentment when we could already have it in Christ. And so as I close this morning, I wanna say enough with the self-empowerment. God wants you to be empowered, but not by yourself. He wants you to have an empowerment that comes from him because that is an empowerment that lasts. It will stand your feet on something firm, your contentment, your joy. It will no longer stand on things that can be snatched away in an instant. Instead, God is offering a joy that defies scarcity. It defies loss. It defies humiliation. It defies suffering. It defies any hard thing. We can already have it. We don't need to add to it at all. So whatever you are facing right now, whatever you think that you can't get through, whatever you think, if I just had this, if I could just get to this point, then I would have joy. The question I wanna ask you is, what would it mean to trust God, to let him get on the bike of your life, to hand over control, to surrender to him, to let him direct it in the direction that he wants to go. And instead of panting after all these things, the disappoint, what would it look like in this season to find your joy in him? It is waiting for you. We already have it available to us. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, this, this idea of the riches of Christ, it's an abstract idea. This idea that you are in us, it's an abstract idea. And I I feel that tension every time my kids during prayer time ask, why can't I see Jesus? Why can't I just see him? And I think that what they're saying with their little kid minds and hearts is actually something that even adults feel as well. And that is why we run after the things that we can see. We run after the things that we do think will give us joy, will give us contentment, will give us security. And what you're begging us, pleading with us to open our eyes to is the reality that those will only drive the bike into a ditch, that they will keep us in this place of constant insecurity and constant needing to control. But to be disciples of Christ means that we already have all that we need. You know what we are created for. You know how you want us to live. You know what it looks like for us to flourish. We simply have to surrender our control. And so I pray that everyone who's listening this morning, that we would search ourselves and ask, what is the area that I don't want to surrender? What is the thing that I'm running to for joy instead of Christ? And what would it look like for me to lay that down and to seek my joy in you? Holy Spirit, give us the clarity that we need to make those kinds of hard decisions to take that next step towards you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. My light, my strength, my song, this corner.
says let us proclaim the mystery of faith and then the people say this simple statement that kind of sums up what we believe about Christ it says Christ has died Christ is risen and Christ will come again so let me leave you today with that assurance and that truth and live this week in light of that truth go in his peace church